Hello and welcome. I hope that you are having a fantastic day. Today we're going to talk about Bitcoin investing for beginners and we're looking at can Bitcoin be shut down? This is a naysayer's guide to Bitcoin. So should I buy Bitcoin now or wait? We're going to give you ideas to help you take profits and avoid losses. Can we get this video to 99 likes? Smash that like button. It really helps us out. I'm not a financial advisor. What you're about to hear, this is not financial advice. This is my opinion. So the first thing we're going to look at is the Bitcoin market. Now today is 6.38 in the morning, Central Standard Time. And it is April 27th, 2020. It's a beautiful Monday. So right now, Bitcoin is trading at $7,709. It's up almost 1%, just shy of 1%. And you can see here that the Bitcoin dominance is 64% and changing as we speak. Now, the dominance is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later in this video. Uh, it becomes part of our subject. So we may even come back to this slide. Now... The subject of this video, often, oftentimes my videos, we try and take three or four different articles. This video, I'm going to focus on just the one. Can Bitcoin be shut down? This is a naysayer's guide to BTC. The Bitcoin network has been standing strong for more than a decade, and it would take a highly coordinated effort from competing players to bring it down. Bitcoin's future has many possible outcomes but death is among the least likely of them all. Kind of like the image here with a gravestone with Bitcoin on it. So key takeaways. Bitcoin has been running 24-7 without incident for more than 10 years straight. There are more than 10,000 Bitcoin nodes scattered all across the globe. And governments can prohibit Bitcoin, but they cannot kill it. So let's get back to the 10,000 Bitcoin nodes. The way Bitcoin runs is somebody sets up what's called a node. A node is they're running a computer that's connected to the internet and on that computer is running software that makes the Bitcoin network exist. So in order to really destroy Bitcoin, you have to shut down all of the existing nodes. If there were no nodes out there that was running the Bitcoin software, then Bitcoin would cease to exist. But because there's thousands of nodes scattered all over the world, uh, it makes Bitcoin actually exist and gives it the possibility of thriving. Uh, the people who wrote the Bitcoin software made it what, what's called open source. And that simply means that Anybody can download it, install it on their computer, and run it at no cost to them. You don't have to pay Microsoft, for example, in order to buy the software and run it. You can just run it without paying any specific individual or entity. So, Bitcoin has been dealing with skeptics and naysayers for more than a decade. When Satoshi Nakamoto first shared his life's work publicly, it was met with little enthusiasm. Instead, the feedback was mostly critical and listed all the ways the idea would fail. Have you ever had a good idea and everybody started telling you how come this is not going to work? Well, Satoshi Nakamoto went through the same thing. Since then, the protocol has improved and hundreds if not thousands of companies have been built on Bitcoin. Uh, in fact, you know, when you say that, did you know that Microsoft, Starbucks, and the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange teamed up, spent half a billion dollars and four years building what's called BACKT, B-A-K-K-T. The BACKT exchange was built by those three companies, Microsoft, Starbucks, and the company that owns the New York Stock Exchange. All three are multi-billion dollar companies and they've invested half a million dollars into creating a Bitcoin exchange. And now they're soon going to be releasing an app for your phone that will let you buy and sell Bitcoin along with a whole bunch of other things. And so it's actually quite interesting. So when they say that a lot, hundreds if not thousands of companies have been built on Bitcoin, 
That's just one example. There are so many examples of other companies that are built on it. Still, the criticism remains constant. High-profile economists, bankers, investment fund managers, everyone except the Queen of England, really, have voiced their opinions and prophesied Bitcoin's inevitable demise. Um, But the interesting thing is, is that to date, none of them have uh, accurately uh, predicted the demise of Bitcoin. One decade and 115 exahashes of hash rate per second and roughly $150 billion in market capitalization later, and it can be said that such critics stand corrected. Well, let me break this down a little bit. So, 115 exahashes, that's the measure of the computing power that's currently mining Bitcoin. Um, It's a combination of the nodes and then also includes the hash rate of miners. And so uh, miners connect to nodes and, and create the entire Bitcoin network. And there's a way that they measure that processing power, that computing power, and that measurement is called exahashes. So let's for a moment take a look at the chart. So this is the last uh, one year. This is the one year chart of exahashes and you can see how it starts here at 45 exahashes a year ago, uh, hit a peak of 121 and then at the same time that uh, everything crashed as far as the stock market and other assets, including the computing power on the Bitcoin network also crashed. And then you can see that it's come back up 118 versus 121, so it came very close to this previous high and then dropped down just a little bit over over the recent few days and weeks. And so uh, I wanna share with you a couple of other charts. So this is the one year chart. Let's take a look at what it looks like over the last three years. And so three years ago, the computing power on the Bitcoin network was 3.9 exahashes and recently it peaked at 121 exahashes. And so that's a, um, uh, I don't know how many times that is. It's not quite 100 times because it would have to have been at 1.2 for it to have been 100 times, but that's a, a significant increase in the amount of computing power. Think of it this way. Every time it goes up, somebody else has added another computer to the Bitcoin network. And every time you add another computer to the Bitcoin network, that's one more computer that would have to be turned off in order to shut down the Bitcoin network. And so this exahash, this hash rate measurement, is really a a way to measure all of the processing power because one computer has a lot of processing power and another computer has only a tiny bit of processing power, but every single computer adds up together to give us a total number. Um, And I don't want to muddy the waters too much, but there's lots of different ways that miners use equipment to mine Bitcoin. Some of them are computers. Some of them are what's called graphic cards. So in your computer, there's a card that drives the monitor and they call that a graphics card. And so some people use graphic cards in order to mine Bitcoin and that adds to the hash rate. Another thing that people will do is they'll buy what's called ASIC miners, A-S-I-C-I-C, I I don't remember how to spell it, but bottom line, an ASIC miner is an application specific integrated circuit. Um, And that means that they built this small box. They're usually a little bit smaller than a shoebox in size for an ASIC miner. And those things have chips in them that the only purpose for that chip is to mine Bitcoin or mine whatever cryptocurrency it was built for. And those chips are anywhere from 30 to 40 times faster than using uh, uh, graphic cards. Graphic cards were at one point one of the fastest ways to mine Bitcoin, provided the most hash rate to mine Bitcoin. Uh, But ASIC miners came around, I I don't know if it was three years ago or five years ago, but uh, several years ago, ASIC miners started becoming more and more popular because they had more hash rate. And you could buy them for a lower price than you could get comparable hash rate out of 
uh, GPU miners, out of graphic card miners. And so anyway, the bottom line to this whole story is you can see how the hash rate has been growing over the years. In fact, if we click on this link here for the all-time graph, you can see how it was, for, for many, many years, it was significantly less than one. I mean, all the way through here, it's less than one uh, uh, terahash. And then in here, around August 2016, in fact, here's where from April of 2016, to today, it's increased by 100 times to get to that 121 exahash. So anyway, the bottom line is, is because of the hash rate that's measuring the amount of computing power around the world, it makes it extremely difficult to shut down all of those computers, especially when, I mean, they're located in, in virtually very close to every country around the world. And so just makes it quite difficult to shut down the entire network. So what could possibly kill Bitcoin? One strategy is the so-called 51% attack, where a malicious entity gains control over the majority of the network's hash rate and effectively takes over the system. 51% 51 att attacks are one of the most legitimate threats to Bitcoin. The centralized manufacturing of mining equipment can lead to some bad outcomes, but the most dangerous scenario is one where there is a concentration of hash power. Specifically, one company may control more than half of the hash power on the network. Consider the cost of executing such an operation. At the time of this writing, it costs more than half a million dollars per hour to sustain a 51% attack on Bitcoin. And so what, are they, what, do, what does this really mean? What they're talking about is if you bought enough computers that your total hash rate was greater than 51% of the hash rate on the entire network, this would allow you, because you had control over it, to rewrite some of the data in the network, thereby granting yourself a lot of Bitcoin. And by giving yourself a whole bunch of Bitcoin, all of a sudden it make you, makes you wealthy or wealthier. But the point that they're making here is that the cost in order to do that is, is very, very significant. In fact, according to this website, uh, which is Crypto51, Crypto51 says that a 51% attack on Bitcoin would currently cost $847,988 for a one hour attack. In other words, it's almost a million dollars per hour in order to attack the network. But that's not the only hurdle you have to overcome. Not just uh, having more hash rate, more hash power than anybody else in the world, uh, but let's dig into this a little bit further. The attacker would also need to coordinate all of these features without anyone noticing with over 10,000 Bitcoin nodes operating around the world, it would be near impossible to sneak a 51% attack by so many observers. In other words, um, you may be able to create enough hash power to have more than 51% of the total hash rate on the Bitcoin network. The problem you'll have is all of the other 10,000 nodes operating around the world going, hey, wait a minute, somebody just did something they shouldn't be doing. And if all these other people notice, then that, that destroys your opportunity for making money. And it destroys it for several different reasons. One, people would stop using the Bitcoin network because you or whoever the person was that had all that hash power hacked it and altered it so that they had an advantage. Um, and then the second thing is, is that all these people running these nodes would simply merge off a new version of Bitcoin, deleting the records where you had moved that money to your own account, um, thus deleting all the advantage that you spent all that money getting. And they would just fork off Bitcoin into a brand new fork and, and start mining it. In fact, if you look at look back over history, a lot of the not a lot, but a number of the existing cryptocurrencies existed because they are forks where they took the existing Bitcoin code, 
and they made some tweaks and they modified it a little bit and then they created a brand new cur uh, cryptocurrency. But that cryptocurrency was based off of the previous software and the previous blockchain database that was used for Bitcoin up to the point in time where they forked it off of the existing network, the existing blockchain and database that runs the current version of Bitcoin. And so not only would they have the issue of trying to make sure that they had 51% of the power, but they also really need to do it in a way that no one else would notice it, which is pretty highly unlikely given that there's over 10,000 nodes. Now this picture doesn't give you a definitive conclusion on every single country that, that Bitcoin is in because some of these dots are so small that they can't actually, cannot actually be seen in the map. There's more than 98 countries around the world that currently have Bitcoin nodes. But here's another thing. If you are running a Bitcoin node in a country where you may be breaking some of the laws, then you're going to use a VPN network to hide the physical location of your soft of your hardware. And thus, you'll look like you were in uh, mining from a different country when the reality is, is maybe you were located in a country that was not so friendly um, to Bitcoin and you just chose to hide it. So there's there's a likelihood that many of these countries that don't show any Bitcoin nodes actually do have Bitcoin nodes because the owners are actually hiding the fact that they're in, they're in a Bitcoin node. Um, but you can see by these bit larger circles and the darkness of the circles where a lot of the hash, hash rate or Bitcoin nodes are located. We can see a lot in the United States. We can see a lot of them in, uh, in Europe and around the European Union. We can see quite a few down around Hong Kong and Singapore and other Asian countries. Um, and so, and then we can see a number down here in Australia, and there's uh, quite a number throughout China in different areas throughout China and even into Russia. And so they're all over the place. These are the kind of the Russian nodes, and then a lot of the Chinese ones are down in this area. So just a, a large, large, Bitcoin has built up a huge network, and it's be, because of that huge network that the entire system has a lot of security. Once the alarms had been rung around social media, many users would begin selling their holdings, recovering the 556,000 spent on attacking the network thus becomes difficult. And that figure has changed to over $800,000. So once people started selling off, driving the price down, that the people who did the hack would have a tough time recovering the money that they uh, spent in order to hack the network. Bitcoin Core developers would also fork the protocol around the attackers before this scenario ran its full course. Concluding, it becomes quickly it quickly becomes clear that it is a, this is reasonably an ineffective venture assuming that the attacker wants to overtake the network for profit. What if they have no ulterior motive except to destroy Bitcoin? A 51% attack still wouldn't be the way to go. Even though Bitcoin's price would undoubtedly suffer damage in the short run, Bitcoin's network can easily mitigate such threats and continue to operate with minimal incident. So can Bitcoin be banned by different countries? Absolutely. There's been countries out there all along that have banned it. China is a great example of that. China has had this uh, love-hate relationship with Bitcoin. They love the miners. They hate people doing exchanges and buying and trading and putting their money and finances into Bitcoin. And so while it's legal to mine Bitcoin, it's illegal to buy Bitcoin, which is just a strange thing. Sure it can. There's nothing stopping regulators in any country from around the world from prohibiting the use of Bitcoin. In case there are any constitutional considerations, regulators can still find ways to make Bitcoin a cumbersome and unappealing to use as possible. But can regulatory agencies ban, destroy Bitcoin? No, not really. It would undoubtedly have some short-term price implications, but the network and the protocol would remain intact. Again, they would just literally have to go 
all around the world to all these different countries shutting down the nodes in order to actually achieve that. And so while they may be able to make it uh, ban it, make it difficult for people to, to buy it, it would affect the price uh, in a, for a period of time. Uh, but the end result is the, the protocol would m remain intact. Some experts in the field, like the author of the Bitcoin Standard, have even argued that be the banning the top cryptocurrency could have a positive effect on adoption, a social phenomenon known as the Streisand effect. Attempting to hide, ban, or even cover something up inadvertently draws more attention and interest from onlookers. And so, um, you know, it's kind of like trying to ban drugs. Every country in the world has laws against drugs, and yet they can't seem to completely stop drugs from getting into their countries and from people actually purchasing those drugs. So what about Bitcoin competition? Theoretically possible, but highly unlikely. Bitcoin's appeal doesn't originate from its technological superiority over cryptocurrencies on the market. Many would argue that Bitcoin isn't technically superior and that other cryptocurrencies have better features, including faster transactions and greater flexibility. And that's definitely true. There's other cryptocurrencies that have been created since Bitcoin began that in many different ways have better features, greater flexibility, uh, are much faster transactions, etc., etc. But the reason why Bitcoin is still king out there is simply because so many people are using it. It's a more of a what's called a network effect. And what a network effect talks about is sometimes the best technology is not the technology that everybody uses. Let's take Windows as an example. When Windows came out in the 90s, Windows was not the best operating system out there. There were other operating systems that existed that were actually in many ways better than Windows. In fact, uh, than, better than Microsoft's um, uh, disk operating system, DOS. MS-DOS was the operating system during the 80s for Microsoft. And then they came out with Windows. And when Windows first came out in the 90s, it was very, very clunky. It was very difficult and cumbersome to use. Apple's software was much, much better than Windows. But here's the catch. Windows, Microsoft's operating system, started as, a, uh, uh, as the software that IBM personal computers were running on in the 80s. And because of the name of IBM backing those PCs and Microsoft writing the operating system for those PCs, Microsoft gained market dominance. In other words, 80%, 90% of the computers out there ran on Microsoft's operating system. And because it was such a large number, it wasn't any longer about which one was the best. It was about which one does everybody use. And so as a result, because Microsoft had such a market dominance, it continued on and Windows is the most used computer operating system out there, even though it hasn't always been the best. So it's not always about being the best. Sometimes adoption or the number of people using something, using a particular thing is far more important. You know, even take a look at, um, today we have CD players, but there was a day uh, back in the 90s where there were two different video formats. There was beta and VHS. And so when you went to Best Buy, you might buy a beta player in order to, to buy movies and play them at home, or you might buy a VHS player to play VHS tapes. Now, the tapes that worked in the beta machines don't work in the VHS machines. The problem was is that VHS, even though it wasn't, beta was better quality, beta had a better image quality, uh, beta was longer lasting. There were a number of good things about beta that made it a better technology than VHS. But the people who made beta charged so much money that beta never gained enough adoption. The people who made VHS, they knew that their technology wasn't as good and so they just simply made it cheaper. And because it was cheaper, a lot more people bought the VHS machines. 
A lot, a lot more manufacturers made the VHS machines because that was another thing about beta is they locked it in and so they were the only company that sold it. Now today you can't find a VHS or a beta machine out, out there because both of them have been replaced by CDs and DVDs. Um, but here's the important thing to notice from that. It was more about adoption that made it the dominant player and not about which one was really better. And a lot of people miss that in their cryptocurrency conversations. They're so focused on which one is the better technology that they miss the fact that the one that has the greater adoption is oftentimes the one that rules the roost, not because it's better, but because everybody uses it. And right now, Bitcoin is the one that has the 64% adoption. The vast majority of people who have investments in cryptocurrency have it invested in Bitcoin. In fact, earlier I was talking about the BACT exchange, B-A-K-K-T. BACT has only one cryptocurrency on it. Now there's over 2,000 cryptocurrencies out there, but if you were a institution, because BACT only serves institutions, and so you have to have a lot of money in order to just be a customer on the BACT exchange. You know, if you have $100, you're not going to be a customer for the backed exchange. And the only cryptocurrency that the backed exchange offers is Bitcoin, which is just, a, 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 to me, almost mind-blowing. Why would they only offer one cryptocurrency? You would think that they would have a dozen or so. Um, but that's the way it is today. I imagine that down the road, the backed exchange will actually offer more choices in cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin's value proposition lies somewhere else entirely. Bitcoin is the scarcest, most widely adopted, and most secure cryptocurrency on the market. Having enjoyed first mover advantage, its network effects are now the strongest, which gives it an almost insurmountable edge over the competition. Uh, network effects is just a fancy term to say, hey, lots of people use this sucker. All right, so... Users still want Bitcoin. Bitcoin has many layers of redundancy and its resistance to many types of attack. It cannot be shut down, hacked, regulated out of existence, or compromised. For Bitcoin to die, it would have to be more of natural causes. People would have to stop using it because there are better, more secure, and more practical options for storing value on the market. As for now, with 64% market dominance, Bitcoin is king. And so just like VHS and beta, you can't go and find anywhere that sells those machines. And the video stores that used to rent those tapes have long gone, uh, they, they're out of existence today. You can't find a video store to rent a VHS or rent a beta tape in order to watch a particular movie. It's going to take the same sort of thing with Bitcoin for it to really disappear. It'll be the sort of thing where something comes out, people start using it and stop using Bitcoin. And over time, the dominance that we see here just disappears and becomes something else entirely. And that's what will cause uh, people to shut down all of their machines and for the hash rate to drop back down to nothing is it'll it'll be more about People just stop using it. Um, and so we're at this particular time, based on things like the hash rate over the last, even if we go back to the three-year hash rate, we can see how it's been just growing, 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 growing quite significantly. Um, unless that stops, uh, Bitcoin is here for a long time, you know, the long term. It's here to stay unless people stop using it. So that's the video today. Again, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice. This is my opinion. How can I be of service to you? Do you have any questions? Do you have any uh, things that you, you just you, you want to talk about? Um, uh, do you have anything that you're curious about? Or do you disagree with what I've said? I would love to hear your polite disagreements because look, hey, you know things I don't know. I know things you don't know. And when we share what we know together, we're going to grow smarter together. I want to grow smarter together with you. So, hey, please share what you know down in the comments below. In the meantime, like, subscribe, and hodl. 
and I hope that you have a fantastic day.